Hello and welcome to another video where today I'll be taking you through a management accounting techniques or MAX for short mock exam. This has been by far the most requested video I've had but unfortunately it has taken a while due to my ability to access the mock on my laptop. However we are now sorted and this video will be split into two parts. Part one covering tasks one, two and three and part two covering tasks four, five and six. Before we start, I wanted to give a huge shout out to the sponsors of today's video, Accountex. Accountex are a specialist publisher of AAT materials, so they produce both study text and question banks for all levels of AAT. So that's level one through to level four. I have used their study text extensively and in my opinion, they are the best books for anyone looking to distance learn AAT because of the way they are written. The structure and flow are really good and they try to make complex topics as simple as possible. If anyone is looking for study text or additional practice questions and mocks, please go check out the account text website that I'll link in the description below. If you do follow me on Instagram, you'll already know this, but they've also been kind enough to offer anyone who's watching my videos 20% off the price of all their books. All you need to do is use the discount code WILL20. Excellent. Right, let's get into the walkthrough. Right then, so the Management Accounting Techniques exam is a two and a half hour exam and you'll have to complete six tasks. So I'm sure you have looked at one of these before, um, but if you haven't, it will consist of four tasks as you've probably done before. So relatively normal uh, drop downs or entering figures into boxes. And then tasks five and six will be done on spreadsheet software. So slightly different to what you've done before. However, I will take you through the full mock uh, and explain each step and obviously the answers as we go through. Right then, so let's get on to task number one. So task one is worth 24 marks and is about costing techniques. This task contains parts A to B. So part A, identify whether the following statements about absorption costing are true or false. So statement one, the value of inventory under absorption costing is lower than the value under marginal costing. So that would be false, starting off with. So under absorption costing, remember we include not only the variable costs, but also a proportion of the overheads, specifically the fixed production overheads within the value of the product. So under absorption costing, your inventory, because it includes not only the variable costs, but the fixed production costs as well, that would obviously make the inventory value higher. So under absorption costing, the value of inventory would be higher than under marginal costing. Next one on the list, the absorption cost of a product always includes fixed non-production overheads. So again, that would be false. So I've just mentioned that we do include part of the fixed overheads within the cost of the product. However, it is the fixed production overheads, not the fixed non-production overheads. So that one would also be false. Part two then, identify which two of the following are included in the value of inventory under marginal costing. And this is for two marks. So remember for marginal costing, we are valuing our inventory using the variable costs that go into making the product. Okay, so that would include out of this list, the prime costs. So remember your prime costs are your direct materials and direct labor and any direct expenses, although less common. So all of those would be variable. And then it would also include your variable production overheads. I mean, that one is literally in the name, it is a variable cost. So remember under marginal costing, the way they describe it is it's the cost of producing one more unit. So it's all the costs that go into making one extra unit. Okay, fantastic. Right, moving down. A department has materials which are no longer required in production. So they're currently in production and have been returned to inventory. Part three, identify the journal entries required to record this transaction. And this one's for two marks, so one mark for each. So, 
it was in production, it's no longer required in production. So it's leaving the production and returning to inventory. Therefore, the double entry to record this would be to debit our inventory. Remember, inventory is an asset. So to increase the value, you would debit it and you would credit the production. Now, initially, if that were to move from inventory into production, it would be the opposite. So we would debit our production and we would credit our inventory. But because it's going back from production to inventory, it will be to debit our inventory, therefore increasing the value and credit our production account, reducing the value. Moving down, so Marvelous Bakery is a manufacturer of breads and cakes. Specialist ingredients are used in the manufacture of basic cupcakes, as well as flour, which is used in several other products. During November, 20,800 kilograms of flour was issued to the production of basic cupcakes with a value of £51,168. Part B then, identify the correct journal to record the issue. So if I just refer back to the previous question that we just spoke about, this is now an example of what I was just talking about. So this is where the ingredients have left the inventory and have gone to production, obviously to produce the goods, in this case, the basic cupcakes that the business is manufacturing. So to record this, we would credit our inventory, therefore reducing the inventory and debit our production. Now, once these had been manufactured, they would then leave production. So we would credit production and we would debit our inventory. Now, obviously it would be under a different code for our inventory because obviously we might have inventory for the raw ingredients. So in this case, it's saying flour and we'd have obviously a different code then for complete products. So in this case, the basic cupcakes. Now they've not gone into that level of detail here because under this particular syllabus, we tend not to go into um, that much detail. However, we can see that it's left inventory and has gone to production. Now, next on the list, it says the specialist ingredients for basic cupcakes were ordered once during November. Marvelous Bakery uses the economic order quantity to order the specialist ingredients. The following details are available and we have the annual demand, we have the annual holding cost per kilogram, the ordering cost and the cost per kilogram in November. So part two of this says calculate the economic order quantity of the specialist ingredients for three marks. So this is a formula you will need to learn for the exam. I'll include it on screen now. So just to break this down, it would be the square root of the following equation. So it would be two times the cost of placing the order. So the ordering cost times the annual demand divided by the cost of holding one unit. So the annual holding cost per kilogram for one year. So if we input those figures into the formula, it would be two times 45, which is the cost of placing an order, times 135,000, i.e. the annual demand, divided by the cost of holding one unit, which is 15 pence. Now that comes out at 81 million. So we want to then do the square root of that figure, which gives us our economic order quantity of 9,000 kilograms. It then states, calculate the total cost of the November order of the specialist ingredient. So it says the cost per kilogram in November is £4.50. So we do our 9,000 kilograms multiplied by our cost per kilogram of £4.50, which gives us a total cost of 40,500. Now I don't have any major tips in terms of remembering the formula for economic order quantity. It is something that you will need to learn. However, once you've got it, it's fairly straightforward. If you think about it, there's not that much to it. So fingers crossed, it shouldn't be too difficult.
remember one of the things you can do is if you keep it in your head right up until your exam, there is absolutely no issues of you walking into your exam and as soon as you've got your paper and your exam started, writing it down straight away so that you don't forget. Okay, let's move down. So in addition to the flour and the specialist ingredients, the other costs incurred by Marvellous Bakery in the production of basic cupcakes in November were as follows. And we can see that we've got direct labour, variable production overheads, fixed production overheads and fixed administrative overheads, i.e. fixed non-production overheads. So part one then, or part four as it were now, calculate the total prime cost of basic cupcakes in November. So just looking further down, we can see here that we've got to calculate the prime cost, the marginal cost and the absorption cost. Now I will give you a brief overview as we go through these, but if you do want a more detailed video on what is included in each of these and examples of each, I will link a specific video that I've done for those in the description below. Right then, so the first one, calculate the total prime cost of basic cupcakes in November. So the prime cost is just your direct cost. So that would be direct expenses, direct if there is any, although unlikely, direct materials and direct labor. So in this example, we have direct materials and we have direct labor. So our direct labor figure is given as the top figure. However, we have two sets of direct materials. So we've just worked out the specialist ingredient. So that was your 40,500. But then if we scroll further up, it also stated that we had during November flour that was issued to produce these cupcakes of 51,168. So to get our prime cost, which would be our direct materials and direct labor, it would be the 51,168 plus our specialist ingredient of 40,500 plus our direct labor of 103,000. So in total, our prime cost would be 194,668. Now the marginal cost is our prime cost plus any further variable costs. So that's usually 99 times out of 100, and especially for your AAT exams, will be the variable production overheads. So it will be the costs that we've included within our prime cost, plus our variable production overhead. So if you remember earlier, I said that the marginal cost was all the variable costs that go into making our product. So it would therefore be 194,668 plus our variable production overhead figure of 56,250. So if we add those two together, that gives us a total marginal cost of 250,918. So the next one then says calculate the total absorption cost of basic cupcakes in November. So our absorption cost will be what we've included within our marginal costs plus our production overheads, our fixed production overheads. It will not include our non-production overheads. So in this list of examples here, we've got the fixed production overhead at 96,326. We need to include this to get our total absorption costs. However, we do not include the 48,124. It would therefore be our previous total marginal cost plus our fixed production overhead of 96,326 to give you a total absorption cost of 347,244 pounds. So scrolling down, it says Marvellous Bakery has been working on a batch of large novelty cakes for an event in December. At the start of November, work in progress for the novelty cakes was valued at £3,264 with the following further costs incurred during the month of November. And we've got direct materials, direct labour and production overheads. 
calculate the total cost of production to date for the novelty cakes. So nice and straightforward this one, all we need to do is add our cost together, so direct material, direct labour and production and overheads, and add that to the work in progress value at the start of the month. So if we add those four figures together, that will give you a total cost of production of £151,875. Now following on from this, it says at the end of November, 1,900 novelty cakes were completed and 800 novelty cakes were partially completed. The partially completed, so the work in progress novelty cakes, were 75% complete. Calculate the cost per equivalent unit of the novelty cakes. Enter your answer to the nearest penny. So we've got 1,900 novelty cakes that were completed and 800 novelty cakes which were partially completed. Now the percentage here is absolutely essential to working out the cost per equivalent unit. So what we're saying is 800 of those novelty cakes, so 800 novelty cakes, were 75% complete. So to get the equivalent fully produced units, we would do 800 of the partially completed cakes multiplied by the percentage of completion, which in this case is 75%. So 800 times 75% gives you 600 equivalent novelty cakes. So to calculate the cost per equivalent cake, all we would do is take the total cost of production that we worked out in part C, I, so the 151,875, and divide that by our total equivalent units. So that would be the 1,900 plus the 600 that we've just calculated, so the 75% of 800, and that would give us a cost per equivalent unit of £60.75. Pence. And then the last section on this task says calculate the closing value of work in progress of the novelty cakes. Enter your answer to the nearest whole number. So to calculate the work in progress, we need to look at the cakes that are in work in progress, so our 800 cakes. Now to calculate the value of just the work in progress section, all we would do is take our partially completed cakes, again, multiply them by 75%, so it would be 800 multiplied by 75% to give you 600 equivalent units of our work in progress. And then we do 600 equivalent units multiplied by our cost per equivalent unit of £60.75 pence which would give us a closing value of work in progress of the novelty cakes of 36,450. And that covers task one, so hopefully nothing too complex there. Let's now jump into task number two. So on to task two, which is worth 24 marks and is about attributing costs. This task contains parts A through to B. Kitty Pie Limited is a manufacturer of kitchen equipment. Overheads are allocated and apportioned to departments using the appropriate basis. Part A then, identify the most appropriate basis for each of the following overhead costs for four marks. Okay, so we've got four different overhead costs here. We've got depreciation, office rent and rates and department supervised salaries, and then lastly, electricity supplied for machinery. So when we're looking for the most appropriate basis here, this is basically the best or the fairest way of splitting these costs across multiple departments. So we'll start off looking at depreciation of motor vehicles. So the best way to split depreciation would be based upon the carrying value of machinery. So that would be the fairest way of splitting out the depreciation to various departments. Often that's going to be your production departments as well. So that would be carrying value, 
It's also worth noting the reason for that being if we think about the department with the highest value of machinery will obviously have a higher depreciation amount. Therefore, by splitting it based upon carrying value, depreciation will be apportioned on a fair basis to the relevant department. We then have office rent and rates. So the fairest way of doing this, a common ground, should I say, would be floor area. So each department would more than likely have a square footage that, that they take up of a building or factory. We then have a department supervisor's salary. So the most appropriate basis for this would be for it to be allocated. So it's more than likely that that supervisor works solely in one area, more than likely on factory or production process, and therefore the best way of making sure their salary goes to the right place would be to allocate it directly to that department. And then the last one, electricity supplied for machinery. So I think this fits rather nicely with power usage. So obviously the more power the machines use, the more of that particular overhead would be allocated or a portion, should I say, to that particular department. So the fair basis there would be power usage. Moving down, the value of actual overheads incurred by Kitty Pie Limited last month was lower than the overheads absorbed for the month. Part two, complete the following statements for two marks. So one mark for each. Kitty Pie will have, and we need to select from, either underabsorbed or overabsorbed overheads last month. So if their actual overheads were lower than the overheads absorbed, then they have overabsorbed their overheads. So they've entered in or budgeted an amount that was higher than was actually incurred. So they have overabsorbed overheads and this will, and then we need to select from, have no effect, increase or decrease profit. Well, if they have overabsorbed their overheads, they've effectively put too much of their overheads in. So their expense is too high. So by correcting that, because actual overheads have come in lower, that would therefore increase the business's profits. Obviously, if actual overheads were lower than what was absorbed, that's a good thing for the business and therefore it would increase their profits. Okay, moving down. So Zay Limited is a furniture manufacturer and has two cost centers, production and assembly, and three service centers maintenance, delivery, and administration. Budgeted overhead costs have already been allocated and apportioned for the next quarter. The overhead costs of the service centers need to be reapportioned to production and assembly. The basis for reapportionments are below. So we can see that administration is split as a percentage of total employees, the maintenance by the carrying amount of the plant and equipment, and delivery by delivery hours. And it also states underneath that this information can be viewed in the references section to the right. So if we click on the references section, which you can't see on screen right now, but if you were to click on that, it would give you this information within the table just so we don't have to necessarily scroll as much. It then says complete the table by reapportioning costs of the basis of the information given. Enter your answers to the nearest whole pound and use minus signs to indicate any negative figures. So a similar situation to our prime marginal absorption costs in the previous task, I have done a specific video which goes into this in much more detail than what I will go through in this uh, mock exam. So if you aren't sure about anything around allocation and apportionment, please do go and watch that video. I'll link it in the description again uh, so that you can easily access it. Right, let's start going through these then. So there has already been, so the process of allocation and apportionment within this question has already been done. And what we need to do is reapportion those costs to the relevant centers. So let's have a look at our table and let's have a look from there what we need to do. So the first one to start off with here, so top of the list is administration. So we can see that administration, which has overheads of 675,000, 
needs to be split based on the percentage of total employees for the four other departments. So what we would do is 675,000 and then multiply by 45% for production, 25% for assembly, 15% for maintenance and 15% for delivery. And by doing that, we can then enter those figures in to our table below. So that would give you 303,750, 168,750, 101,250, 101,250 again. And then in this last box, we need to show that that 675,000 has been taken out of our admin department and successfully moved to our other departments. So we would show this as a negative 675,000 so that there is nothing left within our admin column. So the next one on the list is our maintenance and this needs to be split based on the carrying amount of plant and equipment. And we can see that we've got values in for production, assembly and delivery. So what we would now do is we would take the amounts that are under maintenance, so our 178,750 and our recently moved 101,250 and add those together to get the total overheads that are now sat under our maintenance column. So if we add those together, that gives us a total of 280,000. So we now want to move that 280,000, we want to split it based upon the carrying amount of plant and equipment. So what we need to do is first add up our carrying amount of plant and equipment. And if we add those together from production assembly and delivery, so our 560,000, 490,000 and 350,000, that gives us a total carrying amount of plant and equipment of 1.4 million. What we then do is we take our 280,000 that's currently sat under maintenance and we want to divide that by the carrying amount of plant and equipment of 1.4 million. So it would be 280,000 divided by 1.4 million and then we would multiply that by 560,000 for production and that would be the amount that is then reapportioned to production. Okay, we'd want to multiply it by 490,000 for assembly, and that would then go to assembly. And we'd want to do the same, but with 350,000 for the delivery, and that would then go to delivery. So that gives you the amount of 112,000, 98,000, and then for delivery, 70,000. We then want to show that this maintenance amount has been removed, so it would therefore be minus 280,000. And then lastly comes our delivery. So delivery is going to be split on delivery hours between production and assembly. So we'll follow the same process. So add up all the overheads that are now within our delivery department. So it would be 137,750 plus 101,250 plus 70,000. And that would give you a total amount of overhead that's currently sat under delivery of 309,000. The next step is to add up our delivery hours for production and assembly. So if we add together our 6,280 hours and 3,720 hours, that gives us a total of 10,000 delivery hours. So we would take our overhead of 309,000 in delivery and divide that by the 10,000 delivery hours. And then we would multiply it by 6,280 hours and that would go to production. And we do the same, but with 3,720 hours and that would go to assembly. So that gives us amounts of 194,052 pounds and £114,948. And remember, we need to remove our 309000 from delivery to show that this has now been reapportioned to our production and assembly departments. Excellent. So that completes our reapportionment table. Let's now scroll down.
So it says Zay Limited uses activity-based costing to calculate the overhead recovery rates. For the production department, this is the number of production runs. For the assembly department, this is the number of inspections. So very similar to what I've said above, I do have a specific video that I've recently brought out for activity-based costing, which again, I will link in the description and I will run through in that video in much more detail how to approach a question. A bit more detailed than this one, um, it sort of runs through the full process rather than just capturing snippets. Um, but if it is something that you struggle with, definitely go check that out because I think it will really help. So anyway, it says the following information is available for the next quarter and we've got number of production runs and number of inspections. And we've got the budgeted amount and the actual amount. Part two then says calculate the overhead absorption rate for the production department on the basis of number of production runs. Enter your answer to the nearest whole pound. So let's scroll up slightly. So in our production center, our overheads we've calculated in the question above to be £1,846,260. And the number of production runs are 54. So we need to calculate the overhead absorption rate for the production department. So to do that, we'd take our overheads of 1,846,260 and divide it by the budgeted, very important this, the budgeted number of production runs of 54. And that gives us an overhead absorption rate per production run of 34,190. So the next question says calculate the overhead absorption rate for the assembly department on the basis of number of inspections. So we'll use a very similar process. So our overheads for assembly are £1,841,860 and we want to divide this by the budgeted number of inspections of 19. So that gives you an overhead absorption rate for the assembly department based on the number of inspections of 96,940. It then says calculate the overhead absorbed for the production department. So to calculate this, we have our overhead absorption rate. So what we need to do is now apply this to the actual number of production runs. So our overhead absorption rate for the production department is 34,190 that we've just calculated. We need to multiply that by the actual number of production runs of 56. And that gives us an amount absorbed of 1,914,640. We'll now do the same, but for the assembly department, so there were 18 actual number of inspections completed. So we would take our overhead absorption rate that we calculated just above, so the 96,940, and multiply that by the actual number of inspections of 18. And that would give you the actual overhead absorbed for the assembly department of 1,744,920. So the last question on this task, it says the actual overhead for the quarter for the production department totaled £1,915,368. Calculate the amount of under or over absorbed overheads for the production department for the quarter. And we need to enter your answer to the nearest whole pound. So we now have the two amounts that were absorbed for the production department and the assembly department. Now in this one, we're focusing just on the production department. So the amount absorbed just above that we've calculated for the production department was 1,914,640. Now the actual overheads were 1,915,368. So they were higher than what we've absorbed, not by a huge amount, but they were higher. So first we need to calculate the difference between the two. So we'd minus one from the other, which gives you a difference of 728. So we can enter that in. 
and then we need to select whether they were underabsorbed or overabsorbed. Now, because our actual overheads were higher than what was absorbed, we've actually underabsorbed here. Obviously, if we'd absorbed more than the actual overheads, then we'd have overabsorbed, but because we've absorbed lower than what's actually happened, we've underabsorbed. Fantastic, so that's now covered task number two. Let's move on to task number three. Right then, on to task three then, which is worth 24 marks, and is about short-term decision-making. This task contains part A to C. Part A then, identify whether the following statements about contribution are true or false for two marks, so one mark for each. Statement one, contribution equals fixed costs, less variable costs. So that one would be absolutely false. So contribution is equal to the selling price of a product less its variable costs. So that one would be false. The next one, contribution can be calculated per unit and as a total figure. That is absolutely true. Not much to add on that one really. Contribution can be calculated per unit or as a total. Quite easily calculated to get to your total by doing it per unit multiplied by the number of units. So nice and straightforward. Match the following definitions with the type of cost behavior. So again, two marks, one mark for each. The total cost increases in an equal proportion as the volume of output increases. So we need to select between four different options. So the type of cost that increases in proportion to the volume, i.e. is variable, would be your variable cost. No surprises there. So that's just a, a nice example if you've done level two, something that you will have covered extensively. So for a variable cost, if one product costs 10 pounds to make, two products would be 20, three products would be 30 and so on. The next one then, total cost has an element of both fixed and variable cost. So this would describe a semi-variable cost. So this is where, as it says there, we have a fixed part and we have a variable part. So a typical one that they used to use was such as a phone line where you maybe paid a fixed amount each month to have the phone line and then you might pay per call. Excellent, nothing too complex there. So moving down, Mosley Heights is a small hotel with 90 rooms. The costs of running the hotel are as follows. So we've got food, consumables and laundry, which are all variable costs. We've then got labor, which is a semi-variable cost. The cost of managers is fixed and all other staff are a variable cost to the business. The budgeted total labor cost for 90 rooms per month is 54,240 pounds and for 70 rooms is 44,520 pounds. I feel a high-low method calculation coming on here, given that information, but we'll move on for now. Building and finance costs, which are fixed, and then it states that the forecast profit for 70 rooms is shown in the table. Each room is charged at the same rate. So bear in mind, it says that the hotel is 90 rooms, but the forecast profit is only based on 70 rooms, so not full capacity. Part B then, complete the table to show the forecast profit for 60 rooms, calculating the variable and fixed elements of the semi-variable costs for both 70 and 60 rooms and calculating the forecast profit per room. Enter your answers to the nearest whole pound. And this is worth 10 marks. So I'm assuming looking at the number of boxes, it's one mark per box. So we'll start off with revenue then, which is a variable amount. So to calculate our revenue for 60 rooms, we would simply take our revenue for 70 rooms of 308,000, divide it by 70 to get the amount per room, and then multiply that by 60 to get the amount of revenue for 60 rooms. So that works out to be 264,000. Starting off nice and easy. We will follow the exact same process now for the variable costs. So we would do 45,500 divided by 70 rooms multiplied by 60, which gives us variable costs for 60 rooms of 39,000. 
Right, so we now get on to our semi-variable cost and to calculate this, we use the high-low method, something that I'm hoping you are familiar with already since you're at mock stage. However, I plug in all the videos today, I do have a specific video on the high-low method. So if you are still struggling, be sure to have a look at that. I, again, will link it in the description so that you can go and have a look. So remember the way in which we start off the high-low method is to do the difference in cost divided by the difference in rooms. So you can see within the information, it says the budgeted total labor cost of 90 rooms per month is 54,240. And for 70 rooms, it's 44,520. So the difference in cost works out to be 9,720. And the difference in rooms is obviously 20. So what we want to do to calculate our variable cost per room, we want to do the difference in cost divided by the difference in rooms. So it would therefore be 9,720 divided by 20 rooms. So that gives us a variable amount per room of 486. So all we want to do now to get our variable element for 70 rooms is multiply that 486 by 70. And that gives us a variable element of 34,020 pounds. Now for 60 rooms, all we need to do again is 486 multiplied this time by 60 rooms, which gives us an amount of 29,160. Now for the fixed element, what we need to do is we need to either take our semi-variable cost for 90 rooms or our semi-variable cost for 70 rooms. It doesn't matter which one you pick, you just need to pick one set of figures and we will use that set of figures to help calculate our fixed element. So in this example, I'm going to use the 90 rooms because it's come first. So what we would do is we would take our variable amount per room, so 486, and multiply that by 90 rooms. And that gives us a variable element of the total semi-variable cost of £43,740. Now the remaining amount, bear in mind, we know now that that all relates to variable costs. So the remaining amount out of our 54,240 must relate to fixed costs. So if we do the difference between the two, that gives you a fixed element of 10,500 pounds. So obviously this amount doesn't change depending on the number of rooms. So it would be the same now, for 70 rooms, and it would be the same for 60 rooms. Our fixed cost for 70 rooms, it states is 180,000. As we know, fixed costs don't change depending on number of production or number of units or number of rooms in this example. It would remain at 180,000. And we can now calculate our forecast profit by doing our revenue less all the other costs within our table related to the 60 rooms, which gives us a forecast profit of 5,340. So the forecast profit per room would simply be our forecast profit divided by our 60 rooms, giving us a forecast profit per room of 89. We can now do the same for our 70 rooms, so the forecast profit was 37,980. And we just divide that by our 70 rooms to give us a forecast profit per room of 543. Now in your calculator, that will come out at 542.57. It says to round to the nearest whole pound. So we therefore round up because it's 0.57. So that would come out at 543. Okay, brilliant. So moving on, it says the owners of Mosley Heights are considering renting some rooms to local businesses on a commercial basis, which would make sense because they've got rooms to spare by looking at the budget. The following additional information is available. So the selling price per room per day is 150. The variable cost per room per day is 25 and fixed cost per room per month are 2000 pounds. 
Part C then says calculate how many times each room must be let each month in order to break even. So to calculate break even, it's a fairly simple equation. All we want to do is the fixed costs divided by our contribution per, it is per unit. Obviously we don't have units as such in this case, it's per room. So remember what I said right at the start of this task, contribution is calculated as the selling price less variable costs. So in this case, that would be 150 minus 25 to give us a contribution per room per day of £125. So to calculate the break even, we'd therefore do the fixed cost per month of £2,000 divided by the contribution per room of 125, which means you would need to let out the room 16 times per month in order to break even. Okay, moving down. Rooms could be rented for 50% more per day if they were converted at an additional fixed cost of 1,000 per month per room. Complete the following table and enter your answers to the nearest whole pound. So the revised contribution per room per day. Let's have a think then. So we've got, if we scroll back up slightly, so we've got a selling price per room per day of 150. Now it says that they could be rented for 50% more per day. So we need to add on 50% to our selling price. So 50% of 150 would be 75 pounds. So if we add that 75 pounds onto our 150 to get our revised selling price, that would come to 225. Less our variable cost per room of 25 means that our revised contribution per day would be 200. It then wants to know the revised fixed cost per room per month. Well, they were currently at £2,000. However, we're saying that if they were converted, this would add on an additional fixed cost of £1,000 per month per room. So we need to add that 1000 onto our existing 2000 to give us a revised fixed cost per room per month of £3,000. It then states calculate how many times each room must be let each month in order to break even under the revised plan. So nice and straightforward, we know how to do this now. To calculate the break even, it needs to be the fixed cost divided by the contribution per room. So it would be under the revised format, 3,000, which are our fixed costs, divided by our contribution per room of 200, means that under the revised plan to break even, we'd only need to let the room 15 times per month. So next on the list, it says you use profit volume analysis to calculate the profit volume ratio for the original and the revised plans. And then it says, enter your answers to the nearest whole percentage. So four marks for this, so we get two marks for each one that we get correct. So to calculate the profit volume ratio, again, a nice simple equation here. All we do is take the contribution per room and divide it by the selling price. So think about what it's saying here, the profit volume ratio. So you're trying to see what percentage of your selling price relates to profit. So if we scroll up under the original plan, our contribution was £125 per room and the selling price was 150 So to calculate your profit volume, it would be the contribution of 125 divided by the selling price of 150 times 100 to give you a profit volume percentage of 83%. And remember, this is to the nearest whole percentage. Under the revised plan, our contribution was £200 and our selling price per room was 225 So to calculate the profit volume, it will be the contribution of 200 divided by 225 again times 100 to give you a profit volume ratio on the revised plan of 89%. Again, rounded to the nearest whole percentage. So then last on the list, it says identify which option is the most financially beneficial to Mosley Heights. 
Well, obviously on the revised version, we have a higher contribution per day and we need to sell less in order to break even. So the best option would therefore be the revised plan. Brilliant, and that finishes off task three. So let's now move on to task four. And that ends part one of this video. I hope you found it useful so far. And remember, if you have, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more AAT videos. I will see you in part two.